Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Hey, this is Shannon Kringen. You're listening to podcast number 10, Goddess Kring Radio. And it is now December 22nd, 2016, as this is airing. I was hoping to do a very upbeat, positive, fun monologue today. Uh, but I have run into some stress, so I guess I wanted to share my recent life experience. I went to Santa Barbara, California for about five or six days recently to visit relatives on my dad's side of the family. And as some of you know, I grew up in San Diego, was born there in 1968. And when I was nine, my mom decided we would move up to Washington and um, her choice, not mine, obviously, I, I didn't want to leave my dad, my grandparents, my school, the 70 degree warm climate with ocean nearby, pretty comfortable existence in terms of physical comfort. I uh, went back and forth between my mom and my dad and my grandma's house a lot. That was kind of stressful in San Diego, but I generally was okay in San Diego. Well, recently I went to Santa Barbara, California to visit different relatives on my dad's side of the family. Um, and I had a pretty good time, although I was afraid to rent a car because I've never done that before. So I had a really um, positive experience staying with my dad's cousin and his wife and their two fun dogs. And then I visited my great, my great aunt who is 89 years old and her health is starting to decline and she's gotten real thin and she has hospice nurses coming to the house. But she's a very, very smart, sharp person and her brain is still sharp as a tack. And she told me all these interesting family stories that I never heard about my own family because I don't really know my family that well. Mostly stories about my dad and his other relatives that I never met that have passed away. So that was fascinating. And she went through some old uh, family sentimental jewelry that she had and gave it to me um, because she knows she has limited time on this planet. She needs oxygen, like an oxygen tank. She's very funny. She's a Bernie, she's 89 years old and she's a Bernie Sanders fan. And she used to run an art gallery in Solvang, California, which is a magical place, kind of like Leavenworth in Washington, a little bit European looking. And uh, she used to run an art gallery there many years ago and a dress shop. And she subscribes to Architectural Digest and really likes high quality design and photography and art. She really appreciates my photography and sees how gifted I am as a designer. And uh, she appreciates my abstract design as well as my photography. And it was just nice to talk with an, a relative that I don't really know very well on my dad's side of the family. And I really, really enjoyed going to the ocean and I got a massage and I finally had the courage to rent a car. I only got my license four years ago. I was terrified to rent a car. I don't know why, because I'm a good driver and uh, I'm amazed how many bad drivers there are that don't signal or do ridiculous things and um, drive too slow, too fast, you know, block the lane, don't really signal properly. So I'm a good driver. And to make a long story short, I was able to rent a car for $10 a day because they had this amazing special deal for the weekend, $10 a day. I am, in, though, in a very much state of anxiety right now in Seattle here, back in the Seattle saddle, I like to say. I wanted to share about my trip to Santa Barbara, and I also want to share about some synchronicity that happened to me in 2005 in San Diego. But right now, I'm a little stressed out. As soon as I got back from Santa Barbara, back into Seattle... Uh, I started feeling sick. I started feeling, um, I guess I'm allergic to the mold that's in Washington that outside, you know, the mold that's outside in the winter and my nose is itchy and I keep sneezing. And in California, I was perfectly fine because I don't think they have mold. They have a lot of eucalyptus trees in, in Santa Barbara as well as San Diego where I'm from. And as soon as I got off the airplane at Santa Barbara, I was like, wow, the air smells so good here. And it was a nice sunny day like it normally is. And 
probably in the summer in Santa Barbara, I would think it was too hot. But in December, right now, Santa Barbara, California, it was about 60 or 70 degrees during the day. And then at night, it got down to 40 something and maybe even 30 something on one night, a little chilly at night, but nice and, and cool. And I mean, nice and clear. You know, the sky is such bright blue in Santa Barbara. I didn't see any smog. It seemed very clean right on the coast. I guess the smog gets blown away, goes down to L.A. or somewhere. But because uh, I remember San Diego being a little smoggy sometimes. But right now in Santa Barbara, it's apparently not very smoggy at all. So that the sky looked bright blue. I took really gorgeous pictures of the eucalyptus trees. I was just loving the smell of the air. But I was feeling kind of shy around my relatives that I don't know very well. And I was feeling um, melancholy about my San Diego childhood and the fact that, you know, the biggest trauma of my life actually has been moving from San Diego forcibly when I was nine. My mom decided we would leave and that really traumatized me in many ways, physically and mentally. The divorce of my parents when I was four, I don't even remember. Like, I never remember them being together, maybe vaguely, but mostly I just remember going back and forth, seeing my dad on weekends, and that it was hard to go back and forth. You know, like I missed my mom when I was with my dad, and I missed my dad when I was with my mom, but I was always excited to see each of them when I went back and forth, and I was always sad to say goodbye to each of them when I went back and forth. So, and then I would visit my grandma and then I would miss my grandma when I was away from her. So basically I kind of had a hard time as a little kid, being a real sensitive little kid, going back and forth. And I still find transitions difficult. So when I got back from Santa Barbara this time, I felt really like I immediately got irritated by my, my sinuses, my throat, my eyes, and my nose and my mouth and my throat are all itchy. I've been sneezing today and I don't think I have a cold. I think it's the pollen, not the pollen, but the mold. In the spring, I have the pollen issue. And in the winter, I guess I've got the mold issue. And the older I get, the more sensitive I seem to be to the mold because it never used to bother me. But when you feel like you have a cold that won't go away, sometimes what that is is an allergy to mold that's outside in the woods around this climate here in the Pacific Northwest. It's very damp and wet. There's a lot of moss and mold in the air in the winter. So that might be a reaction that I'm having to that, and I'm pretty sure that it is because I rarely get sick, and when I do, it usually goes away pretty quick. So... This miraculously disappeared in Santa Barbara and it suddenly reappeared as soon as I got back to Seattle. So I'm pretty sure that's what this is. And I woke up with a really bad headache this morning. I went and saw a new therapist because I got reassigned and I'm really grateful I have Apple Care because I'm low income, you know, Obamacare slash Apple Care in Washington State. So for the first time in my life, I have access to a therapist and it's little or no cost to me, as well as dental checkup and eye exam and regular physical exam once a year. So my wellness check or whatever it's called. So I'm really happy with my health care right now. Uh, but I finally had the guts to rent a car because I only got my license four years ago. And I finally bought a used car, a little tiny smart car. Well, to make a long story short, today I had to take my cat to the vet. So I got back from Santa Barbara and I, I cried and grieved because I had a reaction to being back away from California, going back and forth again. And then today I had a double whammy. I took my cat to the vet because I noticed that he's drinking a lot of water and peeing a lot of extra, you know, fluid, liquid, you know, and uh, he's been coughing and sneezing. So I took him to the vet, got him a blood test, uh, really don't like spending the money on that, but I did. And just going to make sure he's okay, check his liver, kidneys, and thyroid, and give him my antibiotics if he needs it, if he has any kind of infection. Um, so basically, the vet thing was a little bit stressful, but I was relieved that I did it, and I got another modeling gig and got extra money the other day from that, so I thought, okay, now I can afford the vet, and my rent has gone down because I have Section 8, so I'm like, okay, I can afford the vet. So then, today, my car wouldn't start. Uh, but to make a long story short, it did start. It just didn't start for a minute. So sometimes smart cars have weird issues. But usually it starts again. But I took it to the Mercedes-Benz place and they wanted to charge me $3,000 for all new parts. 
And then I took it to this other guy, this independent mechanic on Capitol Hill in Seattle, who does it his own way. And he knows how to work on these kind of cars because very few people in Seattle know how to work on smart cars aside from the Mercedes Benz dealership. And we all know that dealerships tend to rip people off. I mean, they tend to cater to wealthy people who would rather just buy all new parts and not hassle with, uh, you know, the risk of anything going wrong. So just get all new parts for $3,000 or take it to an independent mechanic who will actually just clean it and relube it and realign the clutch actuator for $300. So that's what I did. I had my clutch actuator lubed and cleaned for $300 a few months ago. I don't remember when that was. And then today, my car wouldn't start for a second. And then I waited. I kind of panicked and cried a little bit because I had my cat in the car and he was upset and wanted to go home. So he was crying and I felt sad for him. Uh, he seems to be okay now though. And so then I called my boyfriend and, well, oh my God, my car won't start, ah, you know, freaking out, trying to figure out what to do. And then thank God I tried to start my car again and it worked and now it's acting normal again. So I might want to take it to the independent mechanic again. So I'm sorry that the Goddess Kring monologue this week is, is me documenting the stress of me. <laughs> The good thing is, is that I saw my new therapist today and she recommended a book called The Body Keeps Score. So I, because I refer to my belly all of the time, my belly is where I have a little extra fat on my body. I'm pretty um, strong and healthy and fit, but I have extra fat on my belly. Well, a lot of women do, I guess. I don't have it in my hips and thighs. I have it on my belly. And I know that in uh, chakra... Chakra people would say that's your solar plexus, that's your yellow chakra, your personal power, you know, my upper belly, my personal power chakra, I guess it's orange down below and red in your in your sexual crotch area. So my chakra, I think most affected by the trauma of leaving San Diego so abruptly with my mom was the yellow solar plexus, personal power, self-esteem. Maybe I could read up more up on that. But this book talks about how trauma is stored in your body and and something about neuropathways and how I could learn. I mean, I've been in, in and out of therapy for over 20 years, so you'd think that I would have healed this by now, but I guess I'm just a little bit slower than some people. I might even be a little bit autistic. I don't know. But um, So let's just say that I saw a new therapist today and she recommended this book and she had empathy and sympathy for me about bringing my cat to the vet, trying to make sure my cat's okay uh, because it, he's just had a few symptoms lately and I didn't want to neglect him. So I took him to the vet because I adopted him a year and a half ago and I've never taken him to the vet. So I thought, okay, I'm going to take him to the vet and just get him checked out, see what the deal is. So she said his eyes and ears look great and his, his um, belly and stomach and thyroid and kidney area on his body feel fine. She doesn't feel any strange lumps or bumps. So that's good. And they weighed him and they took his temperature. And so now they're going to do blood work and check his kidney, thyroid and liver and just make sure that that's okay. And if I need to give him any medication or change to a special food for him, I will do that. Um, my policy with my cats is till death do us part. My previous cat, Stella, died of liver and kidney failure two years ago, and that was awful. I injected her with fluids every day for a while, but it didn't help, and she ended up dying on my bed. Um, but I had sort of like kitty morphine for her that they gave me for at the vets to help her feel less pain. And for the last week of her life, she was basically just lying in bed, and I was just helping her transition into her death. So I don't know what's going to happen with my current cat, Kisun. He's a big, nice, orange, fluffy cat. And I think he's still fairly healthy, but I don't know for sure. So I have a tendency to adopt adult cats because I feel sad that other people don't want to adopt adult cats because they're not young uh, and they won't live as long. So that's why I do adopt adult cats and I, I keep them and you know healthy and happy until they need to die and then they pass away. So I'm hoping he'll live till he's 20. I think he's 9 or 10 right now. So we'll see. Next time I'm going to try to adopt a kitten or a one-year-old cat or something so I can have longer time with them. But then again, my cat still seems fine right now. So there it is. 
So this is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. I apologize if you don't find this uh, monologue very fascinating, but this is just some things I need to get off my chest. I also really loved hearing the Madonna speech recently where she talked about feminism. I guess she got a Lifetime Achievement Award or something. I don't know the name of the award. And she mentioned feminism and sexism and how feminism is not just when women don't bow down to men and be subservient to men. Feminism is also when women support other women and when women don't let other women boss them around and shame them. Like if a woman wants to be extremely sexual, why shame her for that? If she's doing it, you know, don't assume she's just doing that to be a slave to men. So some women are more sexual than others. So where I think a real feminist, what I think a real feminist is, is somebody who asks a woman what she's doing. And if she's apparently following her own heart and her own soul and being a strong, powerful woman in a sexual or a non-sexual way, let her do that and support her and cheer her on. You know, sometimes women are very competitive with, with each other. Tori Amos talks about this as well, about how women can sometimes betray each other. So I see Gloria Steinem actually said something once that really upset me. And she's like assuming that all women who pose nude or do porn or do anything erotic or even just nude modeling, you know, she assumes that those women are objectified by men and subservient to men and doing it because that's what men expect them to do is to be sex objects, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's one way to look at it. That's the more like cliche feminist way of seeing that. But really, a feminist is somebody who shaves her armpits if she wants to and doesn't if she doesn't want to and supports other women in shaving or not shaving, wearing makeup or not wearing makeup. Amanda Palmer talks about this as well. So I really liked Madonna's speech. She talked about how she got raped in New York and how, how what, what all the difficulties she had to put up with and the sexism and how Prince was free to be sexy and wear women's clothes and makeup. And yet if a woman wants to be like androgynous and be kind of male in a way like Madonna is sort of like very sexy but also kind of strong and powerful like a man she's kind of like the female Mick Jagger I mean I don't love Madonna's music as much as Mick Jagger I'm more of a Tori Amos Mick Jagger Tom Petty Bob Dylan Neil Young Patti Smith Edie Brickell those are some of my favorite singer songwriter musicians Heather Nova uh, different things like that but I really admire and I love bits and pieces of Madonna's music and I love Madonna's longevity. So my point about this is just that what does it mean to be a real feminist? I think a real feminist is somebody who is supportive of other women and doesn't assume that a woman is being subservient to a man. Don't make assumptions that Madonna is a victim or even Miley Cyrus, you know, and, and some of her provocative videos and her rebelliousness and some of the things that Sinead O'Connor said about Miley Cyrus, sort of assuming, making assumptions that Miley Cyrus was being objectified and pressured into being uh, a sex object by her record label. It seems to me that Miley Cyrus is somebody who knows exactly what she's doing. And if anything, people probably told her to not be so provocative, not be so sexual. You know, we're really a real feminist is someone who is free to be sexual or be not sexual, be more intellectual or be both. You know, women sometimes feel like they have to either be a sexless, intelligent nun type of a person or just a, a flat out sexy whore who's just mostly sexy and not much else. You know, that's absurd. That's so one dimensional and ridiculous. And most of us are sexual beings and most of us are intelligent. Well, I don't know how many people are truly intelligent. It does seem like there's a lot of ignorant people in the world, which is kind of frightening to me. I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. I guess I'll edit that out. Sorry, Kisun. So basically, don't make assumptions or stereotype people. So I got back from Santa Barbara, California, and I was really happy to be there, and I finally got into it. I had a hard time adjusting to being there, and then I finally started enjoying being there, and I had the courage to rent a car for $10 a day. They ran out of the economy cars, so I rented a Chevy Cruze, which I guess was considered a little more fancy than the economy, 
and it was amazing that it had a USB port in it so I could charge up my smartphone in my car, listen to Tom Petty, drive up and down the 101 freeway right on the coast of California, and listen to Tom Petty. That was a dream come true. There's a new song of his called Beautiful Blue by Mud Crutch, his band Mud Crutch, not Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, but Mud Crutch. And just Beautiful Blue was the perfect song to listen to on the California coast. And I did a bunch of videos. I did live Facebook videos. Uh, I, I posted videos to Twitter and to Instagram and to, um, I'm going to soon upload pictures to my Flickr. So my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and Tumblr all have new photos from California on them. If you just Google Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, you'll, you'll find a bunch of my links. ShannonKringen.com is my main website, and I have lots of photos and blogs and video and audio, and here's my podcast right now that you're listening to. So thank you for listening. I'm hoping that my car is okay. I might need to take it back to that independent mechanic and have him look at it and tell me if he can do anything to make sure it's okay. So there it is. I'm really dependent on my car. I drive all over the place as a figure model and I love my car and I've only had it for about four years and it's such a luxury having a car. I will never take that for granted. I rode the bus for 26 years and I lost my patience with that. It took forever to get places on the bus. I have a bicycle, so I would do the bike and the bus and combine the two. I love to go to Costco. I love to go to Trader Joe's and stock up on things and the food bank. So I am just really love my car. So the freedom it gives me and the power it gives me to earn. I earn more money with a car than I ever did without a car because I'm allowed, I can say yes to more freelance gigs. So I really want to keep my car. So <laughs> there it is. So... I am a little stressed out today. My nose is all stuffy. I think it's because of the mold. I hope my cat's okay. So there it is. And um, when I got back from California, I had a really strong visceral response. I, st I, I felt sick to my stomach and I had a lump in my stomach and I cried. I cried about, I remembered how I felt. It's like the wound was opened again. How I felt when my mom and I took off in our Volkswagen van from San Diego when I was nine years old and I felt really gloomy and lonely and scared and physically uncomfortable. I remember stuffing myself with life cereal in the car until my stomach hurt because I was just really nervous about leaving my my dad and my grandparents and my school and the house that I the grew up in. Well, I only lived there for six years, but from age three to age nine, I lived in the same house and I liked it there. And I saw my dad on weekends. And so um, basically when I got back from Santa Barbara a few days ago, I had like, like uh, I hadn't cried like that in a while. I just felt exactly like how I felt when I was nine and we first moved up here and um, we lived in our car and we, I, my mom put me in a couple different schools, alternative schools, and it's just really complicated. It's a very chaotic, long story, but I went from living in the San Diego suburbs to living in uh, the woods in a trailer on five acres because my mom was maybe going to build a house there, but we never did that. Instead, my mom um, got married and divorced and married and divorced and married um, so there was a lot of marriages, and this isn't really going to be about my mom. This is about me, but this is about me just acknowledging that that was very traumatic for me. I don't know what it was like for my mom. My mom was 30 and I was nine. So she was brave, you know, to take off like that and start a whole new life. But I certainly didn't want her to leave me in California with my other relatives. Um, I would not, I would have missed her terribly. But in a way, it would have been less disruptive to me if I could stay in the same school and stay with my dad and my grandparents and stay in my comfortable San Diego 70 degree weather, you know, etc. The climate that I was used to, basically. I'm somebody who's very sensitive to temperature and smell and taste and texture. So I sometimes think I'm autistic because I have such a hard time with... Uh, being really uncomfortable with the smell and the texture of things and I get really I feel unsafe and I have a real response to certain things so basically what happened was I had a response when I got back from Cal from California this time and last time I went to Santa Barbara two years ago with my dad I don't remember having that I have a little bit of that melancholy feeling 
But this was really visceral. I think that's the right word. I just really heavy grief. And I sometimes feel sad that I never got married or had kids. You know, I'm 48 years old. You know, I need to stop blaming my parents for not having kids or getting married. I never think, I never really thought I wanted to get married or have kids. Maybe I thought I would have one kid. I never thought I would get married. I do have a boyfriend right now and we've been together for two years and you know, he and I have talked about me moving into his house, but I'm just too afraid. I, I've lived with two boyfriends in my entire life, and I mostly have lived alone. I've never had a roommate. I'm an only child. I don't want roommates, and um, I don't know if I want to live with a boyfriend ever again or not. I don't know, maybe someday, but I'm too scared right now, and I just got my Section 8, so my rent is very reasonable. It's only a third of my income right now, which is amazing. And I mean, that's the way it should be. I, I think rent should only be about a third of your income for everyone. So if I was king of the world, I would have single payer health care. I would put lots of money into solar power and electric cars and everybody um, would get health insurance or not really health insurance, health care. We'd all get medical care, rich and poor, young and old, sick and healthy. And uh, our rent would only be a third of our income. So, yeah, I don't know how to handle people that are unemployed or not working or, or laid off or fired or whatever. But I just think generally people should only have to pay a third of their income for rent. You know, if somebody makes $7,000 a month, they can obviously afford a lot more rent than somebody who makes 1500 a month. So I know somebody who's a senior and uh, her Social Security is only 1500 a month and her mortgage is $960 a month. So she only has like 500 and some dollars or 400 and some dollars left over to pay for, for food and electricity and internet and cell phone and anything else she needs. So that's pretty scary. So this person is just barely surviving and needs help and um, our system in the US is not very nice to seniors who are low income like that. I've, I've seen, I think my health care plan is better than her health care plan, which is, which is sad because seniors need doctors more than I do. I'm fairly healthy, uh, but I am in therapy for psychiatric treatment and uh, for mental health. And I don't want to take any medications, been there, done that. So right now I'm not on any medications at all. So basically, I am going through some grief. I hope my cat's okay. I hope my car's okay. I know it's not a huge big deal. The problems that I have are pretty mild compared to being a refugee or living in Syria or, you know, being homeless or being schizophrenic or having a terminal disease, etc. I realize that I am lucky in many ways and I count my blessings and I'm very, very grateful in many ways that I have a safe place to live, a boyfriend, parents who are still alive and, and fairly healthy and strong and heading into their 70s. And uh, I'm an only child. I am very, very grateful for those things. I am also acknowledging and don't want to be in denial about the fact that I struggle with anxiety and depression and OCD and mild form of borderline personality disorder, which basically means I'm highly sensitive and I have a fragile sense of self. So I like to say fragile sense of self and tangible desire for wealth. Self-abandonment got me stranded again, polluted and uprooted, meaning that I have a fragile sense of self and a, a low self-esteem and a lot of insecurity because I'm highly sensitive and I was invalidated by certain people in my family off and on inconsistently. I got a certain amount of nurturing and a certain amount of neglect. And so it's kind of a little topsy-turvy and a little inconsistent. And I went back and forth. I mostly lived with my mom, but I went back and forth between my mom and my grandparents and my dad. And I was a pretty good student uh, in my junior high and high school years. I remember early on not trying very hard, thinking, ah, it doesn't matter, whatever. I had a hard time with reading because I think I'm a little bit dyslexic. And I didn't try very hard in school. And my report card said, Shannon needs to ask for help. She seems to think it's not okay to ask for help. And I do remember feeling like it meant I was stupid if I had to ask for help. It's strange that I, 
I don't know why I got that idea in my head that I should just know how to do things. I should know how to read and write and not have to ask the teacher for help. So I was very shy about raising my hand when I when I was confused about something. I had a tendency to just sit there and 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 feel upset and confused and struggle. And then the teacher would come over and say, hey, do you need some help if they noticed? Otherwise, I didn't get any help. So I was afraid to ask for help. So that's a little sad. And I'm just trying to learn to have a little bit more compassion for myself. So I'm just acknowledging some of my personal problems. So I guess this is uh, Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring's um, monologue for December 22nd, 2016. This is uh, her personal, <laughs> this is my personal problem uh, um, podcast. So I am somebody who has always been afraid of denial. You know, I don't want to pretend like I'm better than I am. But then if I go too far in the other direction and I overanalyze my problems, then I might make my problems actually worse than they actually are because I know that words are powerful and that we do create our reality to some extent with our beliefs and our words. So I don't want to overly negatize. I don't think that's even a word, but I don't want to make overly negative my life and my problems. I feel like it's amazing that I have a boyfriend. You know, I met somebody who who is a strong person. He's more extroverted than me. I'm a bit more introspective. I don't really know if I'm as much of an introvert though as I think. Maybe I'm shy and yet not as introverted. I tend to think I'm a, an introvert, but maybe not because how many people want to do a podcast and air it in public that are introverts? Does an introvert want to do this? I'm not sure. I know some actors and songwriters and musicians and performers are actually, and dancers, are actually kind of introverted. Like maybe they don't like parties and social dinners, but they love to be on stage and they like to share in an artistic way, perhaps. Or scientists that get up in front of people and make speeches about science. They might actually be introverts in their social life, but they might love science so much that they like to get up in front of people and talk about, you know, math or science or, you know, whatever they're good at, whatever their, their passion is in life. And they want to, if they feel compelled to communicate it out to, to the public in some way, maybe that's their calling. So I think that uh, Bob Dylan has said something like that in one of his uh, autobiographies that I have, Chronicles or whatever it's called, um, about something about how his nervous system is not really cut out to be a performer and yet it's his calling so he does it. But it's not comfortable for him to be on stage and it's not, you can actually tell, I've seen Bob Dylan live a couple times and he does seem kind of awkward on stage. I think he sounds better in the studio sometimes than he does live on stage. But that's just fascinating. He's a fascinating enigma of a person, kind of introvert, extrovert, kind of rebellious and yet, you know, when people accuse him of being too commercial, he defends that. And then when people accuse him of not wanting commercial success, you know, he says, hey, I want success, you know. So I've heard him say things like that. Interesting stuff. So, okay, what's my point? My point is authentic ejaculation of my soul, molten orange liquid glow, anger takes its toll, blowing status quo. There's another one in one of my poems. Oh, boy. I think I need to blow my nose. Is that too much information for you? <laughs> so I am sitting here with my cat trying to debate if I want to do, there's this part-time freelance job that I have that I do late at night sometimes in my car delivering things. I'm trying to decide if I want to do that tonight because my car might have an issue. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should just, you know, only use my car to drive to modeling jobs and do things that I absolutely have to do. Maybe I should call that other mechanic guy. So I'm just trying to debate about that. And the show, I've been talking for 33 minutes. Can you believe that? That's pretty amazing. So I might share some musical poetry with you now. And then let's see what happens next. So thanks for tuning in. My name is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. Oh, yes, I wanted to talk about the synchronicity that I had in San Diego. Um, in 2005, I went there on a wild and adventurous trip by myself 
to visit a guy that I wanted to maybe date that did not work out very well at all. But at least I'm, I'm proud and that I was brave enough to try with this person. I think we had a soul connection, but it was really dysfunctional on a basic human everyday level. So, but I had this amazing synchronicity in San Diego, 2005. I flew down there with some frequent flyer miles or somebody gave me, I don't know, I got some amazing deal. I don't remember how. And I stayed with, there was two different friends that offered to let me stay with them. So I went back and forth between these two people's houses. And I got a modeling job when I was there, uh, modeling for some uh, figure drawing people at uh, the Museum of Man in Abelboa Park in San Diego. And I was in a mini mart and I saw this magazine and I opened to this page and it said Naked in Ashes and it was a documentary about the holy men of India. Naked in Ashes was the title. And I thought, oh wow, I would love to see that. That sounds interesting and cool. And then I just kept the magazine with me. And then I took a Greyhound bus to Los Angeles to visit my friend whose name is Ismail Bashi. He is an independent uh, actor. He's a the only person I've ever met that's a full-time working actor. He's been in NYPD Blue. He basically saw me, he saw my Goddess Kring show on TV, channel surfing, and he was in a, in a play at the Intamon Theater um, in 2004 or five or something. I don't remember what year that was, maybe 2004. And he saw me and he, and he emailed me and he said, I'd love to meet you, you're fascinating. And so I met him and I got a free ticket to his play at the Intamon Theater, and I met him. We briefly thought about dating, but then we, we both thankfully mutually agreed that no, we don't want to date each other, we're just friends. And then we were just friends. And basically, I went to San Diego to visit two other friends, and then Ismail said, hey, come to LA and say hi to me. And so I did. And I said, um, I, let's see, I can't remember what order this happened in, but I saw the ad for Naked and Ashes, Holy Men of India, and it turns out, I said, oh, oh, then my other friend in San Diego said, hey, my husband and I were thinking about going to this movie called Naked and Ashes, would you like to see? It's about the Holy Men of India. And I was like, yeah, I, I just saw the ad for that and I would like to see that. So I went and saw it with them. And I remember hearing the narrator's voice and thinking, oh, I like this guy's voice. You know, one of the voiceover people in the film, Naked and Ashes, I liked the sound of his voice. And I remember thinking, he has a really nice voice. I wonder who this narrator is. It turns out it was Ismail Bashi, my friend who I visited in Los Angeles. So I went to Los Angeles and I said, hey, Ismail, have you heard of this? Because, you know, he's from India. So I thought, you know, he must have heard of Naked and Ashes about the holy men of India. And he's like, of course, I narrate in that movie. So it turns out that my friend was the voice and I just didn't recognize that that was his voice narrating in Naked and Ashes. So it was kind of cool that I felt like the whole thing was meant to be that I was in San Diego and I saw that ad and then my other friend said, let's go see that movie. And then my other friend is actually in that movie and I didn't know that. So that was kind of magical and it made me feel like I was supposed to be there and experience all of that, including trying to date the guy. The other guy, w it just didn't work out. It wasn't a healthy situation. I don't want to talk about the details, but that just wasn't healthy. So I had to end that relationship um, but I probably learned something from that. So, and then there was some other synchronicity. Let's see what else happened. I went to Ashland, Oregon once. I quit my job and hopped on a Greyhound bus. I met this Australian on the bus and we exchanged information. To make a long story short, I ended up hitchhiking through Mexico with him for a month and well, we hitchhiked through Baja and then we were told that it was too dangerous to keep hitchhiking. So then we took the public bus uh, on the mainland of Mexico. But I grew up in San Diego and so I was pretty comfortable with, with Mexican culture and Mexican people. I love Mexican food and the music and I love the colorful uh, bright colors and the fiesta and just the festive mariachi bands and the just 
just the really like yummy food and the family oriented Mexican people. I, I like that. I was exposed to a lot of very positive Mexican culture as a kid in San Diego. I know there are some people who have seen the dark side of Mexican culture, which is, I guess, the, you know, all the drug stuff and the money, corruption with money and strange like drug cartels and like um, government corruption, etc. But in San Diego as a kid, I was exposed to the positive aspect of me Mexican culture, which was family, loyalty and food and music and just really kind of friendly, festive, bright colors and just like the positive energy of all of that I appreciate very much. So uh, we went to Mexico, this Australian and I that I met on the Greyhound bus and we had very good um, experiences with Mexican families who invited us to stay with them and they f cooked for us and fed us amazing uh, food and were so nice to us and so generous and they were obviously poor and low income and so we ended up um, giving them some money they wouldn't take our money so on the day that we left we got up really early and just put something on the table and snuck out of there so that they would you know enjoy our generosity in return for their wonderful hospitality so they gave us a place to stay and they fed us and they drove us places and that was really nice of them. So that was a pretty amazing experience. Uh, there was some like weird uh, macho-ness. Some men were very macho and a little bit uncomfortable around uh, me and my friend, but um, that's another story. But I don't want to talk about the negative aspect of my Mexican experience, but I mostly had a really positive time in Mexico. And so that was another cool trip that I took. And then I've also been to Florida three times, I'd gone to a naturist gathering in Loxahatchee, Florida, Sunsport Gardens, and really enjoyed being nude and natural with family friendly people there working on healing body shame etc i also ride in the world naked bike ride and the body pride ride and the summer solstice parade here in seattle with body paint so these are some of the positive experiences i've had and i am so grateful that i'm alive and let's see how about some music now check it out goddess kring shannon kringen podcast number 10 pattern of panic pattern of panic panic pattern panic pattern panic pattern instead of saying instead of saying panic disorder panic disorder panic pattern panic pattern pattern of panic pattern of panic pattern of tensing up trauma jumping ahead jumping ahead assuming the worst assuming the worst preparing for the worst for the worst panic pattern panic pattern panic pattern light the lantern out of the panic out pattern, pattern. Out relearn neuro relearn pathways, pathways, pathways to health and balance and balance health and balance and balance new neuro pathways to health and balance and balance and balance from Panic from disorder, panic from disorder to panic disorder, patterns, to, panic to, pattern, to, panic to peaceful patterns, patterns, to peaceful patterns to that are loving and that nurturing, are loving and, and, healing. Healing. Loving and balanced. Hey, this is Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring. I wanted to share about a dream that I had when I was in Santa Barbara, California, recently visiting relatives. I had a Tom Petty dream. As some of you know, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers is one of my favorite rock and roll bands, and he's one of my favorite singer-songwriter performers of all time because of the special connection I feel to his music and my childhood in San Diego and feeling a little bit traumatized, actually a lot traumatized, by moving from California when I was nine. And so Tom Petty, I like to say, Tom Petty widens my jetty meaning it's a double entendre it's you know kind of a sexual thing like I think he's really handsome and I have a big crush on him humongous crush so Tom Petty widens my jetty you know he kind of makes me want to open my legs <laughs> for lack of a better word um widens my jetty but also widens my jetty means you know like when you see people surfing and there's a jetty I feel like uh the music of Tom Petty reinforces me and reassures me that I can trust myself and follow my dreams and believe in myself and I can overcome any obstacle and I can heal from anything that I'm afraid of or you know I can heal my wounds and um, 
I'm feeling a little ill right now. I have a bit of a cold, I think. I thought I was having a reaction to the mold in the air in Seattle, but maybe I'm actually a little bit sick, so I'm feeling a little bit under the weather. So I want to share a dream I had. Tom Petty, this is a cool dream. I am a figure model for artists, and when I was in California, Tom Petty popped into my dream. And he showed up to a figure modeling gig that I had, and he was supposed to model with me. But he didn't want to be nude. He said he felt a little shy about taking off his clothes. He's like, do I really have to take off my clothes? Can I just pose with my guitar? (laughs) And then me and the instructor both said, Tom, you know, this is figure modeling. You have to take your clothes off. And he took all of his clothes off. Quite handsome. uh, Slender guy handsome handsome guy but I in the dream he had tattoos all over his entire body and he said hey Shannon Kringen you're gonna have to show me how this is done because you know music is my forte not figure modeling (laughs) and then the dream kind of faded away before much of anything else happened it was a short little dream but that was just funny because I've had many dreams including Mr. Tom Thomas Earl Petty and usually his wife's in the dream too and she's real nice to me and um Um, is not jealous and competitive and is very friendly and sort of implies that she'll share her husband with me. (laughs) That's kind of weird. And then usually Tom is not into it. Tom is like, oh no, I'm totally monogamous with my wife, Shannon. Sorry. (laughs) That's funny. But um, a lot of the dreams I've had with Tom Petty involve music, you know, where he's playing music, where I walk down the street and there's Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers in the alley and they're playing music. And then I remember that I forgot to bring my hand-painted top hat that I made for Tom Petty, and I wonder if I should run home and get it, fearing that the band will be gone when I come back with the top hat. So then usually in the dream, or I don't have my camera with me, and I'm like, oh, I want to take pictures of Tom Petty playing in the alleyway with his band, and then, but I don't have my camera. So then I wonder, should I run home and get my camera, or should I just enjoy the music? So the moral to the story is, be here now and enjoy your life now. So... Yeah, Tom Petty widens my jetty. Mick Jagger struts in, his dagger grabs me. Tori Amos doesn't blame us, but names us. Neil Young washes away the fertile dung. Goddess Kring, bada boo, bada bing, let it seep from deep within. So that's part of one of my poems. So thanks for listening to the podcast of goddess kring shannon kringen this is podcast number 10 hopefully the next one will be better because i will feel better i feel a little bit ill right now i need some rest i can hear the difference in my voice can you my nose is all stuffed up so my voice sounds a little bit lower and a little different today thanks for tuning in see you next week Torn and torn, human form, reborn. Dominating crocodiles, cockroach slaughter, rats poisoned, fear of bats, extinction of creatures. People dominate this planet. I can hardly stand it. Stranded polluted and uprooted, wake up and smell the Hitler done to Mother Earth. Wake up and smell the Hitler done to Mother Earth.
Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring.